How does Christianity compare to the kind of religion we would invent if we could? That's what we're going to talk about today. Religion was invented when the first con men met the first fool. Mark Twain. See, this is why I kind of wanted to do this podcast was you talk to people like my father and Christianity and even Judaism was built by a bunch of propagandists trying to make themselves look good. Look at us. We were followers of Jesus right from the beginning. And it struck me now that I am a Christian that he never read the New Testament. He has no idea what is inside of it. He doesn't understand how it's structured because people like Mark Twain and people like my dad, when they thought about religion, they looked at it as a human method to control people. Maybe it was the Roman Empire trying to control people by saying, look, Jesus wasn't against us. He said to pay your taxes and be a good citizen and that rulers were put over them by God. So behave and pay attention to us. Or they were propaganda pieces so that people could start their own church and be apostles. Look at me, I'm an apostle. You should do what I say. And I thought it's so funny because when I was doing last week talking about the history of what happened in the church after essentially the first founding of the new churches, this fellow Bart Ehrman, who wrote one of the books I talked about, was talking about the reason that Christianity spread so fast was because it gave a lot of things for us to be inspired about. It talked to the homeless and the poor and the oppressed. It said that the things that happen on this planet aren't really the things that are that important. So don't worry if you're so poor and things aren't going your way. That's not what really matters. What really matters is this big picture of heaven. And it started making me disagree with this book because you can talk about all day long about how Christianity spread and you know, that they were put up in the Colosseum and people thought it was horrible and word of mouth and we had apostles going out there and preaching the word. But this is not the kind of faith that we would have invented if we were inventing a religion or even if Rome was going to invent a religion. It's not the religion we would invent at all. And so people who think that Christianity was some kind of plot to get people to pay attention to the government or was some kind of plot to fleece people out of things. It's funny because Jesus told his apostles, when you go out there, don't bring a bag, don't bring stuff, because that's what charlatans did. They'd go to a town, they would do something miraculous, and then they hold their bag out so he could throw money in it. Or even when we came across that group of people who were trying to heal in the name of Jesus without believing in Jesus, and they ended that in a huge hurry. These were not people getting wealthy off of the church, nor was it really working to keep people down because they realized Caesar's not God and Caesar's children are not gods. And suddenly the whole Roman Greek religion started to fail. So then I started to think, if humans created a religion, what would it look like? I mean, what would it actually look like? And then now we can sort of see why Christianity is very, very different from that. I mean, first of all, if we were creating our own faith, we would, first of all, focus on personal gratification. You should give me all the money because I'm wonderful. And it would all be, you know, very much validating every desire we have. I want to be rich. I want to have sex with lots of people. I want to ignore the poor and go live my best life flying around the world on jets, you know, and if you have more money than you should have, then you should be giving it to me so I can have a great life too. It would not teach any sort of morals. It wouldn't teach about sexual sin, greed. It wouldn't talk about uh, pride and being prideful and arrogant. It would tell us that we should be prideful and arrogant because we're pretty special people, aren't we? It wouldn't tell us that we would have to accept everyone. You know what? Our church, we're the pretty people. We don't accept those other people inside of our church. And we wouldn't be welcoming to the people we don't want to be welcome to. When we have homeless people show up at our church services on Sunday, God wants them there. That's part of Christianity. But if this was a man-made church, well, they're just going to mess up our church and make it all mussy. 
We don't want them there. It would be certainly about helping us gain personal power. It would promise us that if we followed this new age church, we would become successful and healthy and beautiful and everything we ever wanted would be gained by this. It would just manifest itself to us. We would talk about how you can't backstab us in our own church. We would talk about how we wouldn't be able to be told that what we're doing is wrong, that we would all be in deep with what we think our identity is as human beings. It would all be about us and who I am and living my best life. And it would be easy and convenient. We wouldn't have church services. We wouldn't have to do things. We wouldn't have to serve God. It would just be something that would be, oh, you know, it'd have every type of food we ever wanted. And we'd never be challenged on anything. It would be something fun, maybe like a football game or something like that. And it would never be serious. This church would never stand as a plumb line, straight up and down, so that we would look crooked in our own lives compared to what the church has asked us to be, what God has asked us to be. And the other thing is it would just tell us that we have control over our lives. It would be some kind of a weird self-help, oh, I don't know, monstrosity that we can do everything we want to do, that we can be whatever kind of person we want to be, that it's going to help me meet my human potential, that we're going to be better. And it probably wouldn't have any of this mysticism, hocus pocus, right? We would just be all very self-help science-based, probably, you know, some sort of a pseudoscience telling us how we should live our best lives so that we can go on and become rich and all those things. A human invented church would look very different than what we have right now. It would be based on our most low level human instinct. It would be based on our biggest desires that we have in life. And honestly, that is not the way the church is. Maybe the church was appealing because it talked to slaves and homeless people and the poor and the sick and people who really needed help. I mean, for sure, that's a huge benefit to them. But let's just talk about what it is the church actually said to people. First of all, it talked about forgiveness. We're not much into forgiveness. We don't want to forgive people. We want to get our revenge on people. We want to shame someone who somehow makes our life worse. Jesus talked about humility, that we should not be prideful. We should not be arrogant. We should not be looking for our own status, but instead look towards God, who is the source of everything good. He is the foundation of everything good. It's not us. Everything we have that is good, everything that we get is good, everything that we do is good is all because Christ gave it to us, and we should not boast about anything of that. And our faith also preaches that self-sacrifice is more important than looking out for ourselves, even preserving ourselves. I mean, think about that guy who had all that food. He had to go build a second barn so he could store all his food. Not necessarily a thing of arrogance. He could have been worried, well, what happened if a giant famine comes? I want to make sure I have enough. But instead, he was looking after his own abundance instead of looking out for self-sacrifice. The rich man, Jesus told him to give up everything. The, the, the Pharisee said, you know what? You can follow me, but you're not going to have a home. Self-sacrifice is the most important thing because Jesus said, you know what? You're going to take up your cross and follow me and deny themselves. Deny themselves isn't the idea that I'm going to deny I don't know, my sinful behaviors, or I'm going to deny myself some treat I really want to have or some sin I really want to do. Instead, it's about taking everything that's a part of our instinct and going against it, denying our human basic self and and looking for a spiritual self, a Holy Spirit-filled self. This is not what we want to do. It talks about sexual morality, it, and it talks about living a moral life. And that means we're not going to be greedy. We're not going to be arrogant. We're going to have chastity. We're going to stay within our marriage and keep our marriages going. And we're going to live a life that, honestly, people don't want to live. We look at people today, and they don't want to live that life. And they would rather give up their faith and this 
promise that Christ has given them so that they can live the sexual life they want to live today. They want to live with their boyfriend before getting married. They don't want to have restraint. They don't want to say no to someone because it's what they want to do. The Bible also tells us to be content with what we have and avoid greed and start looking towards eternal treasures instead of earthly treasures. But we want earthly treasures. We want to have all the things. We want the fancy car and the fancy home and the beautiful property, and we want to go on jet-setting careers. But we're told to avoid greed, look towards heaven, and trust in what God gives us as provisions. You think about uh, Thomas Jefferson, right? He wrote and put everything supernatural out of the Bible. He wanted a very human, non-supernatural Bible. But instead, what we have is we have an unseen God. We have a Holy Spirit. We have a God the Father. We are trusting in things that we can't see and trusting in things that we could not produce in front of us. Not only that, we have to recognize that the world had a creation, that the world is created for a purpose, that this world is going to have an end. And so we have to trust a lot of things that we have never seen in the past and that we have yet to see in the future. We have to love each other. Right now, I see a lot of people working very hard not to love each other to fight with each other, to disagree with each other, to cut their parents off or cut their children off or no longer talk to people, wondering whether they can have a Thanksgiving meal together because now they hate those people. When instead, God says that we should love everybody, those we like, those we dislike. Someone said that Christianity is not measured in how much we love God, but how much we love Judas, the the, the person who betrayed Jesus more than anyone? Can we love the Judases of the world? Can we love the lowly of the world, the the homeless of the world, the people who don't live like we like to live? Or we find, I want to say unattractive, but sometimes you see someone who is homeless on the street and you don't want to go anywhere near them because of many different things. But Christ tells us that we have to love even the people that are hard to love. We have to serve each other. We should wash each other's feet. Jesus told us to do that instead of seeking power, instead of trying to be first. Remember, the apostles were, the the sons of thunder were going on about, well, can we sit on your left and your right? Can we be the best? Can we be your main dudes? And Jesus is like, no, you're looking at things the way the world looks at things, trying to seek power and authority because they saw that in the world around them. Caesar, he had his main people. Jesus is telling you, no, you are to be servants to all. And that we should be patient, merciful, that we should forgive as we want to be forgiven, and we should take the narrow road the world takes, the wide gate, going after all the things that this world has to offer. Jesus says, no, no. I want you to be patient. I want you to take up the cross and come in through the narrow gate, the harder gate. And in the end, the hardest probably thing of all is being grateful for our suffering. Paul, we're just doing 1 Corinthians in the Bible in small steps, was saying, we're poor, we're hungry, we're thirsty, we look dirty. Paul spent a great deal of time in jail and we're grateful for it. We are blessed because of all of this. And so we are told to feel encouraged when these things happen to us, when bad things happen to us. And instead, that's not what we want to do. We want to feel grateful because we had that awesome trip to southern France. We don't want to be grateful because we had pain and suffering. And so I think it's interesting in general because the church grew, I think, in spite of this message, not because of this message, telling people to take the hard route, telling people to do the hard thing, which sometimes means walking alone, which sometimes means standing up to powers, which sometimes means saying truth when we don't want to say truth and we just want to shut up and sit in the corner. And that is the church. That is how everything is supposed to go when we are followers of Christ. 
So in the end, why did the church succeed? Why did it cross across the entire world? Because truth is hard to resist. In the end, people follow the truth, even when it's hard, even when it goes against our instincts. And so when I started thinking about the book and the history of the church and why Christianity spread, it strikes me most important of all that it has to be through God's grace because nobody wants this church. Nobody wants to do the things God asked them to do. I joked when I gave my presentation about evangelism. If God didn't came down tomorrow and said, hey, you know all that stuff I said about sharing the gospel with everyone and telling everyone about Jesus, you know, you don't have to do that. I'll take care of it. We'd be like, oh, thank goodness. I didn't want to do that. There are a lot of things that we're called to do we don't want to do. And yet the church thrived despite of it. The church thrived despite of Jesus' harsh messages to the Pharisees, hard messages to the Sadducees, hard messages to the rich, hard messages to the prideful, despite Paul's messages to the churches that were outright sinning, the churches that were wealthy and not thinking they needed anything, to the smart people in the world who thought they knew everything. Despite all of this, despite the fact that the apostles messed up and almost everyone in the Bible messed up many times over, despite all of this, this message thrived from the beginning of time through the death and resurrection of Jesus to, and to this day today. And despite all the things it tells us that we don't want to hear, the church is alive. The church will continue to be alive and hell will not take it over. All right, everyone. Thanks so much. I appreciate you listening to the podcast. I just felt like I had to say that because that book had me all riled up. It is interesting to me when I now watch people who are not Christians, most likely never read the Bible, speak about it as if they know what's in it. And I think we have to do a better job of challenging these ideas that people have about what's in the scripture, what God called us to do, and how God calls us to talk. Please remember that if you have some thoughts about what a man-made church would look like versus a godly church, please email me at jill at smallstepswithgod.com. Love to hear from you. Please tell friends about this podcast and subscribe. And remember, our walk through tough times has Christ and the Holy Spirit and God the Father walking there right there with us.